Welcome everybody this morning and thank you in particular that to those of you that have managed to make it in person today despite travel disruption and thank you all of us, or thank you also to those of you joining online. Um, I think we had around over 200 of you as, as we logged on. Um, and welcome also to BCO and their members as our co-hosts for this event. And thanks also to our brave speakers today for picking up the thorniest of questions and talking us through their journeys from aspiration to delivery on a slightly grim February morning. Um, flagging that this is one of a series and uh, keep an eye on our social media for the next in the series, the, the, the S in ESG. I'd like to take first of all to introduce you to our speakers in turn. Um, property companies um, are setting out increasingly bold ESG visions in response to the climate crisis. Um, the question we're asking of our speakers today is how do we turn those commitments into real outcomes? Answering those questions, um, Chris, Chris, Chris Spotland joined lend in 2021 and is responsible for the development and delivery of the environmental sustainability strategy for lend Europe's investment management and development business. And prior to joining lend Chris spent over a decade at the Better Buildings Partnership developing best practice guidance on embedding sustainability within real estate developments with key initiatives including the BBP Climate Commitment, the Development of Neighbours UK and the Real Estate in Environmental benchmark, benchmark. Jess Kennedy. Jess is a, an Associate Director and char Chartered Environmentalist and leads Arup's ESG advisory offering in the UK. She specialises in strategy and reporting, working with clients globally over the long term. Jess works across sectors, including property, infrastructure, investment, sport, arts and culture, and is able to draw on her diverse experience to support her clients and help them to plot a course through the ever-evolving world of ESG. Nils Raj. Nils is Head of Environment, Social and Government ESG for property company Stanhope. He leads the company's sustainability and ESG strategy across design and construction development activities, asset management and investments through to co corporate governments. Stanhope works across a 12 million square foot development pipeline and a four billion pounds worth of assets under management. Stanhope submitted a B Corp application and its science-based targets were approved in 2022. Prior to joining Stanhope, Nils led environmental sustainability strategy and implementation for FTS, FTSE 100 real estate company Landsec. Nils holds a Masters of Engineering from the École Centrale of Nantes and an MSc from the Technical University of Denmark. Finally, introducing Stephen Hill. Steve is an Associate Director in the Building Sustainability Team at Arup. He specialises in sustainability strategy for property portfolios, master plans and building developments with a particular focus on carbon emissions. His experience spans across both developments and asset management. Steve is passionate about connecting corporate sus sustainability strategy with real world outcomes for both people and the environment. He is Arup's representative on the BCO ESG committee and is a qualified independent design reviewer for the Neighbours UK energy rating system. So thank you all for coming today and for facing this, 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 this crowd. Um, but thank you finally for our, to our events team for making me look efficient, which is, I can assure you, a takes a very dedicated by behind the scenes mission. Um, but we're really grateful for their efforts because it means we can gather in person today to listen to, to hear and to interrogate this illustrious panel. And don't forget there will be a Q&A at, at the end. So please, please collate questions as the speakers speak and we will take them all at the end. So on to our subject of the day. We are all familiar, I think, with the existential imperative to reverse climate change and simultaneously to regenerate our natural environment. I do not believe that anyone attending today, either online or in person, needs convincing of the criticality of these interwoven tasks. Um, and this familiarity has come about because these questions are now front and centre of many and perhaps all of our projects. But what I think is new is the relentless drumbeat of urgency, coupled with a visceral acceptance at the sheer scale of the required transformation and the reality that we have less time to take a meaningful chunk out of the problem than it usually takes us to design and deliver a decent building. That problem is both terrifying and electrifying, I think, and I will admit that I have days when I feel that the former threatens to overwhelm the latter. Um, 
I'm confident though that our speakers this morning will guide us through what real tangible solutions might look like and share the wealth of their experience in delivering on aspirations. Which prompts me to turn to what in this field of sustainability is, I think, probably the most piercing of quotes. It's attributed to Richard Feynman, but millions of others, and you know, some days we all wish we'd said it. Um, it can feel like about kind of half of sustainability is unarguably sensible and half the rest is common sense. But what's left is the intractable problem of making it happen in practice. And bridging the gap between theory and practice isn't, isn't as hard as we think. It's harder than we can ever imagine when we try and do it. Our speakers today will talk you through this and you will hear a particular focus inevitably on net zero carbon, but you will also hear, I think, a trenchant commitment to wider, harder and perhaps less quantifiable imperatives of the broader whole ESG spectrum. And I make no apology for the fact that you will hear repeated messages today. In fact, rather than apologising, I ask you to listen out for the themes that recur as motifs passed from speaker to speaker, reinforcing the commitment that each of these organisations have made to actually delivering change in practice and to the common message of innovating, learning from it, feeding messages forward and moving forward. And I'm going to put a query into your heads as I hand you over to our brave speakers. In old money, I had always assumed, I think, that the consequence of this quote that, was, was that what was delivered in practice would generally be worse than what we had envisaged in theory. My challenge to you all is, with a com solid commitment to learning from the past, a challenge to what's possible in the present, and a grasping of future opportunities to innovate, can we move with the urgency that we need to match the scale of this challenge and to deliver more in practice than we expected to in theory? <coughs> And with that challenge, I hand you over to our first speaker, Jess. Thank you, Jess. Thanks, Mel. And um, to, to echo Mel's thoughts there, I think everyone in this room knows that now more than ever, there is a need to see significant change happen quickly. And I believe the right ESG or sustainability strategy within an organisation can support that change. So I've been working for over 15 years across sectors globally, supporting clients to develop and implement their ESG or sustainability strategies. And I enjoy my work the most when I see a strategy land well in an organisation and make a difference. But there's nothing more frustrating than seeing a strategy gather dust on a shelf or fail during implementation. So what makes a successful strategy? Well, to think about that, it might be helpful to think about the reasons why a strategy might fail. You can think about that in relation to the typical ESG journey. So perhaps the initial bottom-up enthusiasm isn't then matched by top-down commitment. Perhaps there's just too many targets or perhaps targets aren't focused on the right things. Perhaps, aren't te perhaps teams aren't resourced properly or perhaps people aren't clear on their expectations in delivery. Perhaps the supply chain isn't um, engaged contractually to deliver. And perhaps the quality of data being collected is poor. And all of these things can make it hard to demonstrate outcomes and therefore the value of a strategy. So today we've drawn on our experiences, both good and bad, to think about what makes a strategy successful in implementation. And we've structured this around six key themes. Buy-in, accountability, clarity, inspiring culture, informed decision-making and evaluation. I'm going to take you through the first three of those and Steve We'll then take you through the second three. So starting with buy-in and buy-in from the top. So a successful strategy needs resourcing and prioritising. And this can't happen without support from the board or senior management. So to get buy-in at this level, we need to put that evidence base together of the value and outcomes that a strategy will achieve and be clear on the key drivers. I was working uh, recently with a, a Premier League football club on their ESG strategy and one of the questions their senior management put to me was, so how are we going to win? And I thought that was a, a really good example that highlighted the need to, to identify those key drivers that are going to really resonate with an organisation's culture. Uh, to drive delivery, you'll need a champion or a, a sponsor, so that could be the sustainability manager or it could be an add-on to, to someone's existing role. And this person is central to owning the strategy and driving it through implementation. However, it's not the responsibility of the champion to, um, to deliver on the requirements of the strategy. 
this really needs to sit with the leadership across the organisation in the different areas of the business as they will have the ability to drive change in their particular area. In a property context, so we're talking about development managers, asset managers, corporate services leaders, for example. So it's important that this leadership feel invested in the success of the strategy and therefore have a role in shaping it. Employees, as we know, are more and more interested in the sustainability of their organisation and they're also a key resource in terms of understanding um, or identifying issues and coming up with potential solutions. So find ways uh, to raise awareness and also inspire employees to get involved. Without buy-in from a supply chain, the reach of an ESG strategy is limited. And while you can put in place certain top-down requirements, creating that culture of innovation and ways of working um, will be more beneficial in the long term. Be aware that different organisations will have their own ESG agendas, so finding ways to align or work with like-minded organisations is helpful. And also spend some time thinking about existing constraints and barriers that may be currently limiting the ability to drive change within your supply chain. And lastly, buy-in from external stakeholders. So many organisations will share their strategy once it's finalised to, to communicate their sustainability aspirations. But bringing stakeholders much earlier on in the process can be more beneficial. So external stakeholders' perspectives will really help shape the direction of a strategy. And there can be other positive outcomes, such as relationship building, for example. And with your stakeholders bought in, you can co-create. So capture all the good that's currently happening across the organisation, collect ideas for future changes and work with your stakeholders through that prioritisation process and the review process. And that's both through development of the strategy but also during implementation. This brings us to accountability. So with all these stakeholders, you need to think about how people are going to work together and the lines of communication and the leadership that's needed to drive that implementation. For each role, we need to think about the responsibilities and outcomes that people are going to be accountable for and the knowledge and skills that people need to be able to deliver the outcomes you want. You need to think about the training and mentoring, for example, that could support this. And finally, it can be helpful to think about additional incentives for people to engage with the strategy. So this might be creating that healthy competition between areas of the business, perhaps creating an internal awards scheme or um, encouraging a uh, submission to external awards. Perhaps is it, it might be appropriate to connect sustainability performance with um, personal bonus schemes. Or perhaps you can implement an internal carbon pricing scheme to drive behaviour change. My third theme is clarity. And firstly, think about clarity in terms of priority areas. Be really clear up front what areas of your business the strategy is designed to address the geographic area, the scope of sustainability. Is it just environment or are you trying to tackle the full spectrum of E, S and G? And then involve all those key stakeholders in that prioritisation or materiality process so everybody has that shared understanding of what the important issues are and why. For your priority areas, spend that time in research defining your KPIs, your methodologies and the evidence requirements so that you are able to evaluate performance. There's nothing more frustrating if people are spending the time collecting data, but everyone's collecting that slightly differently and therefore the information is not helpful in terms of informing decision making. Don't just focus on the what, really capture the, think about the who, the when and the how. So those processes around data collection, communication, reporting are really important so everyone's clear about their expectations in delivery. And finally, you will need that element of reporting to enable you to capture information and track progress. And whether you're using online tools or, or Excel to do this, make sure it's really clear and simple to use. So invest time in that testing and piloting to avoid users being frustrated during delivery. I'll now hand over to Steve. OK, thanks, Jess. Um, so Jess was talking about the process of taking, of developing a strategy and implementing it within an organisation. So I'm going to talk a bit now about the process of taking that strategy and implementing it in a project delivery context and so making sure that that strategy really does lead to those performance outcomes. So Jess talked about buy-in, about accountability, about clarity. I'll touch a little bit on some of those themes, but I'm going to focus mainly on, uh, on creating that inspirational culture, on informed decision-making and on evaluating 
project outcomes. Um, so in terms of creating that culture, um, Eleanor Roosevelt said, so you're supposed to do one thing every day that scares you. Uh, this is mine, just for the record. Um, so I'm done for the day. Thank you. Um, no, that's not, that's not that bad, honestly, it's fine. Um, but I think if you, if you think about this in a project context, I think maybe it's, it's good to think about doing one thing on every project that scares you from an organisational point of view. And I think the, the culture of inspiration is about enabling innovation, but enabling innovation in a conscious way. So you're aware of the opportunities that innovation brings, but also the risks. And across your, your business, your portfolio, you have the right balance. Um, but I think innovation starts, uh, inspiration starts with selecting the right partners. And that's becoming easier in a sense because a lot of supply chain organisations now are much more open about their ESG objectives. So it's much easier to, to pick, pick organisations to work with on a project that are aligned with your corporate objectives. The next thing then is about communicating the aspiration to that project team once they're assembled. And I kind of think of this as like taking the shackles off the project team, um, if you like. So not constraining them by what they did on the previous project, giving them the freedom to explore new opportunities, but at the same time still looking at and maintaining that balance of risk and opportunity around how you innovate. Um, the next thing then is, is about how we set and how we use targets on a project. And I think this applies at a project level, but actually I think it applies also similarly at a corporate level. So hard targets are very useful in some circumstances, but they do have to be calibrated to be appropriate. We have to know that they're reasonably achievable. So they need to be a stretch for the project team. But as soon as you put a target, or as soon as the target is perceived to be out of reach, then it starts to lose its value uh, and can be a, you know, demotivating, if anything. But there are some aspects of, of, of ESG outcomes that just don't lend themselves to hard targets. And in that case, I think you know, the way to work is much more about communication and collaboration between the client and the project team to arrive at a solution that everybody is comfortable will deliver the aspiration. So that's the, that's the culture of the target setting. Once, once we move into the project delivery, the next thing then is about informed decision making um, and kind of picking up from the quote, this is about using data and making sure that we're being objective in our decisions, not relying too much on anecdote or intuition, which can lead us astray. Um, so we're doing this quite a lot now in the field of whole life carbon, which in a way is quite straightforward. So we're thinking about balance of embodied versus operational carbon on our projects now and we're starting to make decisions on that basis and we know that so things like triple glazing often in many cases uses more carbon in its manufacturer than it saves in operation and it may not make sense similar with chilled ceilings with all that aluminium so in, in a way that's quite a straightforward example but my next two examples are maybe um, not quite you know a little bit more off the wall maybe that's the right word um, so this is 18 Blackfriars um, new developments going into planning shortly um, I could have picked a number of schemes to, to, to talk about this because what I'm really talking about is the way that we, take, we, we gain information about the community that sits around a project through local needs analysis, through communi community consultation. So we gain a, an understanding of what the community needs, what physical services might be missing or um, what shortcomings there are around how that community is served, also what the community wants. Um, and then we take that information and we use that to inform decision making around the design of the development, particularly around the ground plane and the aspects of the development that um, really interact most with that community. So we make sure that the, that the development really is serving the needs of that community. Um, looking from a, a different point of view again, so we're designing developments that are supposed to be highly energy efficient, deliver very high quality internal environments, um, have a lot more biodiversity often than, than previously. Um, so in order for that to be delivered in operation, we need an approach to service charge, to FM procurement, that means we have the energy management skills that we need, um, we have the resource to manage the internal environment properly, uh, and the skills, to m and, the, the skills and the, uh, the resource to manage those biodiverse features. So that, that then often puts us in tension with a, a conventional service charge budget and the conventional way that FM is procured. So we need to, again, we need to be informed by the ESG aspirations when we're setting budgets, when we're looking at the scope of FM procurement, et cetera. Otherwise, we won't deliver those objectives in reality. 
So that's the decision making as we move through the process. Um, once the buildings move from um, construction into operation, we do then need to do a, ro a robust evaluation of their performance. And this really is an industry, I think you, you probably all agree, this has been in the too hard box for too long. Um, it's not something that we do regularly or, or with a great deal of diligence. And you know, that as, a, as a result, we have a gap in our knowledge. Um, but the industry is changing, and this is changing whether we like it or not. So the GLA, through various policies, including BCN, for example, are driving much more transparency. Um, the well standard is being used quite consistently across commercial property now. That requires occupant satisfaction surveys. It requires ongoing indoor air quality monitoring. And of course, I'm sure most of you are aware of Neighbours, which is increasing the transparency of operational energy. And this is really about understanding the difference between performance on paper and performance in reality. And we've talked a lot in energy terms about the performance gap over the years, but the same thing applies to indoor air quality. So when we're specifying all these low VOC materials that we put into our specifications, do they actually result in a high quality low VOC internal environment? Well, we won't know unless we measure it. Um, Similarly for occupant satisfaction, which is almost impossible to measure or to estimate, sorry, in design, and is actually relatively rarely measured properly in operation, but it's probably the best indicator we have of a whole range of health and well-being outcomes. Um, and for those of you who've kind of followed the, the, the neighbor's journey recently, you will know that Australia is a good example of what this um, evaluation process can deliver. So the bottom part of the graph there is the increasing penetration of neighbours' ratings in the Australian market. The top graph is the increasing performance on average of the Aust Australian commercial property stock. So that process of transparency has really driven an improvement in performance. So I've talked about the brief, about setting that culture of inspiration, about setting our targets, about how we make decisions as we move through um, construction, or design and construction, uh, and about then how we evaluate the outcomes. And then the last bit is taking the learning from that evaluation, feeding it back into the strategy, so we create this continual cycle of improvement. <coughs> and if we do that, then I think we really can take ESG theory and turn it into ESG reality. Thank you. So I'm now going to hand over to Chris to hear about life from the client side. Thanks, Steve. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I was asked to give a five-minute overview of how we approach sustainability at Lendlease. So you're getting a whirlwind tour in terms of how we look at this. But for those of you who aren't aware, uh, Lendlease is a global real estate uh, company uh, that operates in key gateway cities across Australia, Asia, Europe, and the, the US. And I guess we're fairly unique as a real estate investment company in the fact that we act as an investor, a developer, a contractor, and an investment manager. So we act across the whole kind of uh, investment life cycle. I'm gonna be focusing on what we do in Europe from a development perspective, focusing on London, uh, Birmingham, and Milan in Italy. But in terms of our purpose at Lendlease, it's all about creating places where communities thrive. So you know, sustainability is fundamentally embedded in that overall purpose, which is kind of very much an important starting point. But looking at our development pipeline, this just gives you an idea of the scale in which we're, we're operating at. But in terms of the kind of projects that we work on, it's all around major urban regeneration schemes. So it's a very large projects. We have nine across Europe at, at the moment, as I mentioned, largely across Europe, uh, as well as Birmingham Smithfields and two projects in Milan. But in terms of that estimated end value, it's approximately uh, 30 billion pounds uh, of kind of uh, development to, to come forward, 31,000 residential units and almost one and a half uh, million square meters of commercial pipeline. So it just gives you an idea of the scale in which we're, we're operating at and need to embed our sustainability strategy within. And I don't have time to go into all the detail in terms of our sustainability strategy and how we embed it, but I just wanted to highlight our two key uh, targets, one environmental and one social value. And these were very much um, set and have been really helpful and powerful in helping us engage internally in terms of what our ambition is and what we want to deliver as a business, as well as externally to our stakeholders in what we expect and our 
kind of long-term tra trajectory. But I'm really going to be focusing on our environmental target, our mission zero, and this is all about being net zero carbon uh, for scopes one and two by 2025, allowing carbon offsets. But then the much harder one is being absolute zero carbon by 2040 with no offsets. And I guess that's what we're going to talk about in terms of actually how do you achieve, is it even possible to achieve that target? I think the, the realistic answer is for unknown, but it's all about demonstrating where we want to be going forward. So talking about translating that aspiration into delivery, in terms of what we do as a sustainability team within Lendlease, it's all about setting that framework in terms of the policies, processes, how this actually gets embedded, and then holding the business to account in terms of monitoring and tracking that performance in terms of how the projects are performing, and then trying to push further in terms of driving that innovation, raising the bar, continuing to making those uh, improvements over time. And so I'm going to just touch upon each three of those in terms of how we, uh, in summary, approach those. So first off, setting that, that framework. Um, at Lendlease, we have our sustainability framework, which is on the left for, for, for you looking at, at the screen. Um, and this is all set around uh, three sustainability uh, imperatives in terms of sustainable economic growth, vibrant and resilient communities and cities, and a healthy planet and people. And each one of those has one environmental focus and one social value focus. And then our targets are underpinned by that. But re this really sets the framework in terms of how we then set particular requirements for each of the different uh, business units and shape policies and processes, etc. But from a development perspective, this really what one of the key documents and kind of that underpins this is our development standards. So for our various different asset classes, we have specific development standards that are quite prescriptive in terms of the sustainability requirements that we expect projects to deliver, as well as kind of best practice opportunities as well to try and incentivize that ambition to go further than our minimum requirements. And so then in terms of holding then the business to account around that, we have a system where every development project gets uploaded into the system to be able to track at key kind of development gateway stages. We require projects to undertake reviews against these particular standards and other requirements for us to understand where the project is at that moment in time, to, to understand as that they're meeting those requirements or not, and if not, what are the intervention measures that are required. But a lot of this was also about providing that ongoing support to the project teams to help them un understand what we expect of them, what are the opportunities that are available to them and, and how we can support that them in that journey. And then in terms of innovating and raising the bar, uh, as kind of uh, Jess and Steve alluded to, as a sustainability unit, you can't be doing everything. It's all about empowering teams to ensure that they have uh, the confidence uh, to be able to, to drive that change to, to think independently around those opportunities that are most appropriate to their individual project. So our role is to empower them and to, to help them understand those opportunities. And then that continual learning piece across all of our different development projects to understand what's, what's worked well, what hasn't worked well, and ensure that's shared within the, the business to, to ensure that we're continually pushing boundaries and driving forward. But you know, in terms of the scale on which of the, of the challenge that we have as an industry. We very much can't do this on our own. It's all about industry collaboration, hence why we're here all this morning around sharing that best practice. And then I thought I'd mention uh, some stuff around some uh, key challenges, but I've just seen that this isn't going to go in the order that I was expecting, um, so I might quickly do <laughs> throw them all up in the slide. There we go. Um, so first off, uh, one of our, I think one of the big challenges that we're seeing is the breadth and speed of change in terms of ESG and sustainability that, you know, over the last two years has been a meteoric rise in importance around this and not just the, the scope in which we're now looking at, but the level of detail within each of those areas that we're having to focus on. And this covers you know, a range of areas from, you know, as, as Steve mentioned, operational uh, carbon, health, health and well-being embodied carbon, biodiversity, circularity, etc. All one of those areas is relatively new. It, re it requires new skill sets, further work, 
uh, it needs to go into much le a greater level of detail than we had before. And th as part of that, in, that now makes a challenge in terms of ensuring consistency across your projects that you're looking at lots of new different areas, a lot of which are, are new, hasn't necessarily been done before. There aren't established methodologies quite in the same way you'd, you'd hope. They're evolving. So then it's really hard to understand or ensure that you're taking consistent approaches across all your projects or the information you're getting back from consultants are comparable with one another. And that's something that, that we're kind of continually working on. And that has another impact in terms of that evolving role and responsibility of the, of the project teams. I don't think we're, uh, we're, we're no longer at a stage that you can say, oh, that's the sustainability consultant's role on the project anymore, in that the, to, to be able to deliver our sustainability aspirations, it needs to be embedded within the whole project team. They are, need to understand, you know, within, when each kind of consultant's package works, they need to understand how their work relates to the overall sustainability targets of, of a project and feed that through. And the sustainability consultant is more providing that coordination role, but also, you know, the sustainability consultant's role has expanded so much further and is almost, I'd say, one of the widest scopes of any project now. And then finally, that the elephant in the room, that kind of value definition piece is still obviously a constant challenge. You know, we're in uh, a particularly challenging moment in terms of rising, uh, rising costs, but actually understanding w where is the, the value in terms of um, ESG and sustainability. We're very much seeing that, I think, in the office market or the commercial space that's that's driving through it's much clearer and easier to demonstrate that in terms of investor requirements occupy demand i think the residential sector is still much more challenging to kind of to demonstrate that piece and see see that come through but also it's trying to understand with with all of these areas you are now looking at going into a much level of greater le level of detail where should the the focus be and what are potential liabilities going forward when you're operating over such long-term um, horizons. And so we're doing now lots of work to try and understand that, particularly from an embodied carbon aspect, trying to embed carbon within our commercial appraisals, understand potential costs, uh, costs associated with carbon, and then forecast trajectories around that. But then finally, just a, as a positive, in terms of our recipe for success or kind of the, the way that we try to articulate things with our project teams, it's all around setting that vision and targets. And you'll see that these are very consistent with what's gone uh, ahead. So that was uh, quite, quite fortunate. Um, so it's having that up front, so it's very clear to the project team what the ambitions are. Then in terms of ensuring that you're actually embedding that into the project brief. And I think what's you know, something that's really shifting now is just being very clear uh, and ensuring that all of these aspirations requirements are uh, to a, a greater level of detail than I think we've ever prepared before and ensuring that they're all fully embedded in scopes of works and contracts, etc. So as I mentioned, embedding that within consultant scopes of works and, you know, not just putting that in the sustainability consultant scopes of works, it's ensuring that all the project team are aware of their specific requirements having a sustainability champion within the project that's hopefully of a senior level that can uh, influence decision making. Utilizing the sustainability consultant, provide it, they're, they're, they're the useful friend of the project to provide that <coughs> coordinating role, and that was my contractual plug that I was asked to, to put in this morning. And then uh, using kind of those tools and uh, the sustainability target as a tool to drive innovation and change, kind of not viewing it as a constraint that you have to uh, achieve, using that as an opportunity. Ensuring that it's continually part of regular workshops and it's not just, oh, we're now assessing where we are at the end of that REBA stage, it's continually driving that throughout the design stages. Thinking about end user experience in terms of the asset management occupier aspects, as well as ensuring you're delivering against the client needs ensuring that the, all the design work and sustainability considerations are embedded in terms of the contractor requirements and selecting them as a, as a partner to try and help continue and drive improvements throughout the construction process and then building in aftercare and post-occupancy evaluation considerations. So that was me, hopefully that was five minutes, but uh, I'm sure uh, lots of uh, food for thought in the Q&A. Now I'll pass over to Niels.
Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Chris. My name is Nils Haj, and I'm head of ESG for Stanhope, as uh, Mel presented before. Stanhope, we are a property developer and asset manager. We've been working in London and the southeast of the UK for about 30 years. And in that time period, we've delivered some of the capital's most recognizable assets from the Tate Modern, the Television Center in White City, Ro uh, um, Chiswick Park here, or um, the Bloomberg headquarters. As mentioned before, we also have a growing asset management arm, and as a company, we're working towards um, reducing our value chain carbon emissions by half by 2030, and working our way through a B Corp certification. Now, as we've heard today, whilst a good sustainability strategy is necessary, it is not sufficient to deliver results. And what I'd like to do in the next seven or eight minutes is to present my thoughts about how we can move from so from strategy to reality. The first thing is we need to start with a clear alignment of value and ensuring that we have a common understanding with our teams. We need to communicate our aspirations early and inspire our teams to deliver outcomes. This value alignment in partner selections is essential and starts really early when we, it's true for the design teams we assemble from the contractors and our property managers. So we need to ask for their plans and their track records in um, delivering, uh, in helping us achieve our goals effectively, understanding what they're doing in evaluating carbon consistently across their design projects or um, decarbonizing their fleet or managing buildings for performance. And in doing so, we also, as a client, need to prompt for skills, capabilities, and resourcing. With the right team, we also need the right brief, as we've heard already today, um, our ESG project brief and asset, manage, uh, asset management briefs detail our um, expectations on projects. It's outcome driven. I'm much less interested in the amount of BREEAM points we score and much more on the actual difference we're going to make to climate change, to enhancing biodiversities or to generating jobs on the projects. Um, the once with the right brief, we then need to plan ahead. And that's true of um, environmental as it is of social performance. We need to plan ahead from the early vision through to detailed design and construction to be clear with our teams about the tangible outcomes we want to achieve. Um, and that's before jumping to badges and certifications. That's particularly true of social value, where we can't necessarily rely on as prevalent industry top-down targets as we have for environmental outcomes. And so if we don't plan ahead for what we want to see, be it a certain level of community engagement or a certain amount of spend with identified priority suppliers group and follow through through the design stages and as our construction progresses, we simply won't get there. An example of where we've done this well in, uh, in planning for it, at least, is at the British Library, which coincidentally was granted a planning approval earlier this week. Through a really in-depth community engagement and uh, an analysis of the local needs, we've put together a social value plan that spans from the, um, the design, the construction, and the operations of the building, allowing us to demonstrate that a delivery possibility of 27 million pounds over an eight years period. Now, as we plan ahead and we look at the expectations, it's also worth important to pause and make sure that if there are um, expectations that are not aligned in terms of, for example, scope, as, as Chris uh, mentioned, we need to be talking about this so that we are clear on the route forward. Once we're clear about this, we need to bring carbon further into our decision-making process. We need to move from the triangle to the square, from the cost quality program, age old triangle, to the cost quality program and carbon square. Now the shape of this square may be slightly bent depending on the client aspirations or the level of maturities, but we've got to um, take bring carbon right in where we make decisions. A, a way that we're doing this uh, at Stanhope is that for the past year or so, we've now been introducing a carbon price into our development appraisal that's proportional to the embodied carbon intensity of the projects. Um, it, it increases in, in uh, 
in value as time passes from about 80 pounds today to 130 by the end of the decade. And it's here to, yes, afford sufficient um, funds to the purchase of credible carbon removals and delivery of net zero carbon in construction, but equally, if not more importantly, to drive our team's behavior towards achieving lower carbon outcomes. If we take steel procurement as an example, some modeling we've done internally on the lower carbon steel options available today, electric arc furnace steel sections or reused steel for which we can now have EPDs. These come with a cost premium, but what we can see is that with the avoided spend in carbon removals and carbon offsets that we have, um, these actually pay for themselves. An example of where we're doing this well is at 76 upper ground on the South Bank here, where our teams are making informed design decisions and procurement decisions on carbon alongside their cost plan. We need to empower brilliant teams and as a client being open and allowing space for innovation. It's clear that we as a client don't have all the answers. Um, we want to be an open client and supporting our teams in coming to us with initiatives and solutions. An example of results there is at Woolgate Exchange in the city. The strip out that we've undertaken last year saw the, um, the direct removal of over 50,000 raised access floor tiles, 48,000 um, carpet tiles. That's about over two thirds of what was there in the first place. Um, and that led in total to a direct reuse and recycling of the products in the building of over 90%, with 15% of that being directly reused in neighboring projects something we can be proud of and simply would not have been possible without um, the team and the, their initiative there. It's worth pausing here as well and um, pondering about how we can better reward performance from our teams in achieving low carbon outcomes. Next, we need to ask more questions. Is everyone on site actually being paid the living wage? Yes, we have a policy for that, but how does it actually translate on the ground? We're very fortunate in working with trusted, long-standing relationships and trusted partners, um, but we can't assume that just because we have policies in place, the, um, these translate automatically on the ground. One way that we are addressing this is, for example, by undertaking workers' um, interviews on our sites, asking about the implementations of our ethical labor policies. The results are certainly encouraging, but I would be lying if I stood here today and said it was absolutely perfect. It's not, but the point is not to point fingers, but it's to identify avenues for improvement and opportunities. We need to reach out and collaborate to solve the thorny challenges that we're facing, as we've heard previously. Um, I could point to many um, challenges from um, mass timber insurance, but the example I've pointed today is, is the necessary engagement we need to make with our occupiers in our managed portfolio. Um, we simply won't get to net zero carbon without them and as a landlord we need to take a stewardship approach in helping them achieve the goals that they set for themselves. We'll need every behavior change we can take to achieve net zero carbon. Now in order to do that whilst we need some proactive engagement with them we also need to tighten our legal recourses and make sure that our leases actually enable this sort of collaborations and enable us in doing the technical improvements to improve performance. And that's why we've been reviewing our ESG provision in our leasing document. Finally, just don't just take our word for it. We need to be transparent and to verify our outcomes. To remain credible, we'll need to point to actual outcomes delivered. And if the past three years have been the years of strategy and pledges and claims and ambitions, I would want the next three years to be the years of actual outcomes delivered. Um, the transparency point also stands to the scope of these claims being made. So as a developer, if we look at our carbon scope and the value chain carbon emissions reductions target I said I talked about before, we're taking onto our carbon scope the operational emissions of the buildings that we deliver post their practical completion, even where we're not actively involved in their management. And that's simply in recognizing, honestly, our responsibility and influence in terms of how they're designed, delivered, handed over, and commissioned for performance. 
it also links neatly with the, our expected engagement as a developer in demonstrating performance in use through schemes like Neighbors. Finally, in verifying these outcomes, we can look to verifying um, the carbon removals and the claims that are being made today. Who is actually three years after having pledged to be climate neutral going back and looking if the trees that were purchased in ensuring these carbon removals are actually still standing? So we need to um, really bake in this permanence of that carbon removal into our pledges to remain credible and deliver these outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you all four for a, a very um, comprehensive tour de force through the subject. We now move to Q&A and I'm going to take advantage of having the microphone and ask the first question. And then I'm going to throw it open to the floor and also to our colleagues online. Um, I'm going to start with a tricky question, I suppose. Um, you've all made some really compelling arguments for, 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 for a roadmap in terms of moving forward. And we've seen some real consistency in what you've been describing. Um, what I'd ask, though, is that you've, you've all illustrated all of those points with some really exciting buildings, some really beautiful buildings, some, really, some buildings that demonstrate what can be done when, as a construction industry, we do our best. How can we, how can we take the lessons from the best buildings and embed them in, in every building? What does that mean, to, to, to take that forward and take, take all of the curve, not just, not just the beautiful end? Steve. Perhaps the microphone, <laughs> enthusiastically. Yes, quite. Um, I, th I think the key thing that I would want to come out of a lot of this is that it doesn't have to be complicated. That's the first thing. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, some of the ESG strategies you, you see, you know, are 20, 30 pages long. They've got 50 or 60 different targets in them. You know, two pages, f six targets is fine. And I think, you know, for smaller organizations that don't have the depth of resource and for parts of the property market that don't have the kind of the benefit that kind of higher values bring, keep it simple would be the, my first thing. Um, and my second thing would be not to get distracted by the idea that ESG has to cost money. I think there is definitely part of the journey in carbon reduction that saves money. And yes, as you get to the end and you start to look in your look in detail at your material procurement, you know, that, that takes up in the other direction. But there is a lot that, that can be done cost efficiently, cost effectively. Energy efficiency, you know, we know where energy prices are going, so I think we need to cover that. Um, and there is, we're starting to see value in the market, and we're starting to see that, that value not just in the kind of prime central London market, but we're starting to see that value more, sort of more broadly. So I think keep it si simple and don't be off-put by the idea that ESG has to cost money would be my, my two points. One more from the panel. Um, so just in uh, built on this, um, what well first shouts about it, and I think event li events like this are part of the solution. Um, uh, on the, to expand on the value point, understanding that um, it, it is where value is going in the past uh, week and couple of past month, having to go in through very thorough due diligence questions from investors and occupiers alike about um, very pointed outcomes delivered by the schemes that we um, that, that that we're putting forward. So uh, explaining that this um, is where the questions are going to be asked beyond what sort of level of BREM do you have. And finally, the last point is, is also the importance of regulation, frankly, to tell all of that tail end with us. Um, we've seen the, the Part Z, for example, with the, uh, the, the pledge to bring embodied carbon assessment in terms in, into the building regulations. Um, we, we simply won't capture all of the projects if we don't have a, a thorough regulatory landscape to support us in doing that. Thank you. I'm now going to take, I'm conscious of time, I'm going to take a question from the floor. Have we got a question from the floor? Yes, sir, in the front. Hi, um, Guy Battle, um, Chief Exec, Search Valley Portal. Actually, I'd like to ask Nielsen and Chris, actually, this question, if that's okay. Uh, just picking up on what, what Neil said about the investor community and what's driving um, ESG. <clears throat> so uh, I'm kind of interested in whether or not the ESG investors really have any depth of understanding of what 
they're talking about. <clears throat> and I, I say that because my my sort of experience so far has been that uh, these investor analyses come in, they ask a series of questions, do you have this strategy, do you have that strategy? They never, other than carbon, where they're getting there, they never really go beyond that, never, they don't really understand what to ask. So I'm just really interested in the drivers you're seeing from that investor community and then how those are being played out into your um, designs. <coughs> Um, easy question then. Um, so definitely we're seeing, as Neil's mentioned, investor requirements increasing, which is very positive and good to see. And they're becoming much more sophisticated in, the, in their questioning. In terms of their understanding, I think that it would be un unfair to say that, that they don't understand that. The, the, po the point is that it, it's, they're, much, they're growing in their understanding. And the reality is that real estate can be complex and there are lots of reasons why things might not necessarily be consistent and standard across the, the board, but it's about having that engagement and conversation with them to help educate them. You know, they're coming to us to invest their, their money. We are the experts. We're the ones that should understand that. We then can explain and communicate that to the investor, any kind of nuances or things for them to, to understand and, and appreciate. So it's all about that that partnership and that growing un understanding. And because, you know, as you mentioned, this is growing so quickly and so so fast, it's about continually upskilling uh, that, that understanding to ensure that we are then making the correct decisions that are correct for that particular that project. So it's that ongoing evolution and learning really. Thank you, Guy. Um, are we, I mean, are there necessary experts about this? Probably not. Um, is the level of maturity growing? I would say so. Had I answered something different last week before I saw what came in my desk this week? Probably as well. But what I've seen just most recently gave me some hope that actually the questions asked were really quite pointed. The sort of number of jobs that were created, but w how much community engagement has been done through what way how are people paid the living wage um and 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 graduating slightly from simply glossing over these these outcomes is there an awful lot more to do to sort of again move beyond talking about jobs in construction yes definitely that's also our role in in advising and educating um, our investor clients thank you I'm now going to take a couple of quick fire questions from from online. We've only got uh, we've only got a couple of minutes, so I'm going to ask for your one sentence answers to these questions. I'm really going to put you on the spot here. And Jess, I'm going to start with you. Uh, question from online from Anne Dalzell. What what is the barrier for achieving good outcomes really? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to give you two sentences for that. Okay. I mean. Hopefully we've gone some way to addressing that today. I mean, I think all of this comes down to, to people ultimately and relationships with people and their drivers for, for making change. And so I think that's the place to really focus is, is culture of, of an organisation and how you encourage people to change what they're doing. Brilliant, very concise answer, thank you. Um, uh, Steve, Chris, I'm gonna give you a quick fire answer. And if you can do this as a yes or no, I will be really impressed. Um, question from Colin Beatty. Neighbours in, the, in, the, in Australia was driven by government stipulating all government occupied buildings had to meet five stars neighbours. Can we expect our government to do the same? Am I allowed a maybe? Yes. <laughs> so I, I won't go into the history, I, I haven't got time. The government consulted on a mandatory version of neighbours, I think it was about two years ago. There is a deathly silence on that point coming out of government. But I think there's a lot that we can do as an industry to make it really easy for government to then step in and mandate neighbours. I mean, the, the industry is driving in exactly the right direction. Um, neighbours is already become sort of becoming baked into the kind of prime commercial offer, in, certainly in, 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 in London, but not just in London. So I think um, the more that we do as an industry, the easier it is then for government to kind of step in and reinforce that. And it doesn't have to be central government. It can, it can also be local government. So maybe, and I hope so. And Chris, can I can I give you the final word for this morning? I mean, I don't think I'm going to expand much on Steve in the the, uh, the same. I, I hope so, but I I think yeah, the reality is that it it will be further down the line in that I think industry will will lead the way, 
and make it easy for, for government to make that decision. Fantastic note to close on. Thank you all for coming this morning. Um, don't forget that we've got the next in our series next month. Keep an eye on your socials to, to get more detail about that and sign up.